Good morning. Today's lesson, we're going to conclude our Easter 2020 emphasis by uh, looking at the final portion of the resurrection and how that resurrection ap applies to us. We've been talking, as you well know, about eternal life and Revelation and 1 Corinthians and about the journey that we're on, the path that we're on, that we, the path to eternal life and how we're going to get there. And then last week, we looked at the truth of the resurrection with respect to Jesus from 1 Corinthians 15, the first eight verses. And what we found in looking at that was four main points. One, that Jesus died. That his blood had to be shed to pay the price for our sins. Two, he was buried. Everyone knew he died. The Romans knew he died. The women knew he died. The men knew he died. They buried him. The women knew on Saturday they were preparing for the, uh, the anointing of his body appropriately on, on the next day. Everyone knew that he died. They buried him. But that he rose on the third day, according to prophecy. And then fourthly, that he appeared to many individuals at that time. So those first eight verses of uh, chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians re re uh, reflect Jesus' resurrection and what we're going to look at today is, why is Jesus' resurrection important to us? Let's just take, a, take a, a few seconds and kind of review, in case you haven't been following along. 1 Corinthians is a letter that Paul wrote to the uh, church that he had established in Corinth. Corinth uh, church was established about 52 AD. Now, about three years later, Paul is in Ephesus, and he's getting reports Negative reports. The church is struggling. Like any new church, it's got some growing pains. And so he spends the first uh, few chapters of, of, uh, of 1 Corinthians talking about church discipline, talking about church issues. And we talked a few weeks ago about immorality and how they had to purge. They needed to get rid of that immorality out of the, the, the life of the church, out of the life of the individuals. we got to keep our bodies pure. And then he went on to talk about uh, worship, the Lord's Supper. He went on to talk about spiritual gifts, chapters 12 and 13. And now as he's concluding his letter to the church of Corinth, and remember last week we looked, he referred to the folks as brothers and sisters. He had a close, brotherly, sisterly relationship to the folks in Corinth. And so he loves them, and he wants them, nothing but the best for them. Uh, but it's still a hard letter. It's still hard issues because they got hard, hard things going on in, in, in Corinth. Uh, the, the, as I said before, the temple of Aphrodite, the immorality that's going on there, the philosophies of the Greek. And we'll talk about a little bit more of that today just to kind of relate why Paul's message is, is uh, combating that, that mentality, that mindset. And um, uh, so he loves them. And he comes down to this last chapter. Chapter 16 is a farewell, all of his greetings to everybody. But chapter 15, he wants to close out this letter with the importance, the importance of the resurrection. We're living life for a reason. And the fact that Jesus died and rose again is the hope and the promise that we had to look forward to. And so we need to live our lives in such a way as if we are looking forward to the resurrection, to the hope that we have, not just this life only. You know, I gave you two pictures uh, last we, the last couple weeks we looked at eternal life, Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. That was two weeks ago. Last week I gave you the picture of Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery, and I kind of painted you a picture. And then I hope to brought that picture around to the fact that what, but the, the opening of the graves and, and, and the bodily resurrection that, that will take place because the Bible says so. And so as we think about that, we're on a journey. Where are we going to in our life? What is it that we're, what we want to accomplish in our life? You know, I went to college and I went to seminary to learn to be a minister, to learn 
the Bible, to learn to teach, to learn to do all the things I've enjoyed doing all these years. But that's not the end. The education wasn't the end. Even now is not the end. There's still more to come. I don't know where God's going to take me five years from now or ten years from now. And I don't know what I'm going to need to be ready for eternity. You see, when I went into college, I didn't know what I would need when I got out of college. But God did. And so God used college, and God used seminary, and God used my first ministry experience at Southside Baptist Church in St. Louis to prepare me for what was going to happen, and going to happen, and going to happen. And so we trust him on this journey as we don't know what's going to be out there on the road ahead of us. Last uh, Sunday afternoon, I was at uh, Casey's up at my house, and uh, Mason Thurman was putting uh, gas or diesel or whatever he puts in his truck. I think it was diesel. I think he's got a diesel truck. And uh, he was filling his truck up, so I went over and I said, Hi, Mason. He'd come home for the weekend, you know, for his family with Easter, and that was great. And Mason is such a, such a joy. Um, I've known him for ever since he was a little baby. And uh, he's, a, he's a very special blessing to me. I just, just having watching him grow and, and knowing him. And, and what I did was I told him, I said, Mason, I want you to know, you may be far from us and you may not see us very often, but I think about you and we, we pray for you. Always. But um, I think about Mason and, you know, Mason grew up watching his dad. Mason watched. Mason learned. And now he does. He took welding and he watched his dad. He took welding in high school at Votech. He went off after high school and professionally trained and certified with welding. And now for the last year, year and a half, he's been doing it. And by all I'm doing it successfully. And who knows where he's going to be. At some point in time, he will be doing and somebody else will be watching him and learning, and then doing. You see, we don't know where God's going to take us. We don't know what we need to have down the road. We don't know what we're going to need in eternity, but God does, and so we trust him. Now, in this very special chapter of, of chapter 15, I told you last week as we read the first eight verses, I said, go ahead and, and read ahead, read through. And as I pointed out that those passages, the, uh, the latter part of this, of, of this 15 that we're going to be looking at are passages that we ministers use at grave size lots of times. We want to provide that hope and that promise, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, So I hope you looked ahead last week. I hope you went ahead and read it. hope you studied your quarterly. I hope you got your learner guide, and I've got my Bible open. I'm going to be looking at some verses that are not in the lesson. So you probably should get your Bible out, or I'd like to suggest you get your Bible out, and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because as I say, we're going to be looking at some verses that are not included in your learner guide. And I want to begin with verse 19. We, uh, your learner guide starts with verse 20. I want to start with verse 19. Verse 19 says, If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. If our only hope is that Jesus will get me through this life, if that's my only hope, is that whenever I have a, a problem, whenever I have an issue, whenever I have too much month and not enough money, whenever, you know, that's the only, I just want Jesus just to solve my problems now. Then we have a very short view of what Jesus wants to accomplish in our lives. And we need to not have the short view, but we need to have the long view. And so this verse before, with, uh, the, we start in verse 20 in our learner guide, but this verse 19 is talking about the importance of the resurrection. If it's only about today, then what good is it? Okay, once again, here's the, two, here's the problem they're dealing with. They're, they're dealing with the Greek philosophy, which says that the body can do whatever it wants. It can be engaged in immorality, and it can be, you know, it can just do all kinds of sin. The body can, because the spirit is going to go to heaven, and they're two separate things. And we know that's not true. We've talked about, I've said that several weeks now in a row, that that's not true. The body and the soul, the body and the spirit, they are, we are one. 
And what we do to this body, how we treat this body, how we prepare this body is what's going to take us to heaven. And we know a little bit about that with Jesus and his body. And we may, we may talk about that in a little bit if I have time and I think about coming back to it. But anyway, um, we need to have the long view and not just the short view. This prosperity gospel that, well, Jesus is just here to make sure that I get the, the perfect job and the perfect car and the perfect wife and the perfect kids. No. That's not, if that's all we've got, that's a very short view of what Jesus had in store for us. He created us to be with him forever. His desire was for Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of life and to live and relate with and have a relationship with him forever. And he's loved us all through that Old Testament. He loved his people, the nation of Israel, so much that he wanted to provide for them the means by which they could be with him forever. And he does the same thing for us. He wants to grow us up, to be his kids, to live with him forever. And for us to think, you know, I just want Jesus to get me through college. I just want Jesus to get me my first job. That's a, that's a very short view of what God wants to do with you. And you need to have the long view. We need to have the long picture of where he's going to take us. So they had to deal with the, the, the dichotomy of body and spirit and the Greek philosophy, and they also had to deal with the Epicureans. And the Epicureans did not believe in the resurrection. They believed it in verse, uh, let's see if I can find it real quick, in verse uh, 20, uh, 32, verse 32 of chapter 15, it says, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Who cares? Let's have a good life now, and when it's over, it's over. So that they had that two philosophies that you could do whatever you want to the body, it didn't affect the soul or the spirit, or it's all about now, nothing about later. And so that, that's what the church of Corinth was dealing with, and that's, what, that's why Paul has spent this entire chapter of 15 with all of these metaphors, all of these pictures. He, I tried to give you a couple of pictures to, to, to give you an idea, He's giving you all these pictures of what Jesus is going to do. You know, in some ways, this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, to me, is almost like John's revelation. You know, Paul got a glimpse, just a glimpse, of what Jesus was going to do in the resurrection to our bodies. And he just went on and on and on and on and on. And we're not going to cover all of it, but, but when you read it, you know, all these verses from, uh, and we'll look at 35 in just a minute, but when from 35 all the way through the end of the chapter, he's just, you got to put this off and take this off. And, you know, he, he tried to explain and tried to describe what he's going to do. So let's look at um, verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? He says, you fool, that which you sow does not come to a life unless it dies. Someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body? Two questions. How are they raised and with what kind? Once again, you heard me say it before. All we know is what we know. And what we do is we trust Jesus. Now, Paul is going to go on. He's going to give them the idea. He's going to try to describe to them what they did. But beyond, beyond the, the picture, all we can do is accept it. All we can do is accept it. So look at verse 20. <clears throat> Let's go back to your, your scripture book, uh, the, the, the learner guide, and look at verse 20. It says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Paul says, here's the fact. We've, been talk we've talked all about Jesus' resurrection. We've talked about the importance of why he was resurrected, how it was a promise to us, why it means something to us. And now he says, we know Christ is raised. Let's just assume that fact, that Jesus is raised. Therefore, he is the first fruit. A long time ago, I used to garden. Back when I was younger, I had a lot more time. I used to do some woodwork and I used to garden. But anyway, I, I had some strawberries. And Ruth Ann and I used to, I got a strawberry. Who was first? 
it's when it came to strawberries in May, you know, we, we, as close to Memorial Day as we could get, who got the first strawberries? <clears throat> and uh, so Jesus is the first fruit. He is the he is the sign. He is that that first fruit. He is that 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 first sign of a hope of the resurrection. And what do we know about the first fruit? The first fruit is what we give to God. That's our tithe. That's the first the first check I write is my tithe check. I got my Trump bonus. I wrote my tithe check. You know, and I guess it wasn't a bonus. It was whatever it was, stimulus. But I tithed on that. First check I wrote. When I got when I saw that money hit my account, first check I wrote was a tithe to the church. And it's the first fruit. That's the hope. That's the promise. And Jesus was that first fruit. He was that hope. Adam was the first Adam, and he died. Jesus is the second Adam. He died, but he rose again. And that's our hope. And that's our promise. And that's what we had to look forward to. He is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. All of those folks who have died, all of us who have died, who, uh, all of those who have died before us, <laughs> Jesus is their hope. And as we look forward to someday when I will probably die, he is my hope. He is my first fruit. He is my promise that I had to look forward to. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. Okay, take a stop for a second. Do you realize how logical God is? There's a created order in which, in the way things, God does things. He is not random and hit and miss and do it this way this time and that way the next time. No. God does everything in a very orderly fashion. You take that grain of wheat, accept that grain of wheat, go into the ground and die and be buried. How can it live again? Same is true with our bodies. Except these bodies die and are buried, how can we hope to live again? There's a logic. And Paul is, is purporting the logic in and, and how God works and the way God does it. He's going to answer that question that we're going to get to in verse 35 that I said, how and what. He's going to answer that question. And that's what he's saying. There's a logic to it. For just as Adam died, so also Christ will be made alive. And Christ is alive. And we talked about that last week with all of the witnesses. Another sidebar. I'm doing some sidebars today. So I, hope, I hope I get the lesson done in decent time. <laughs> I've been reading a book on was our nation founded uh, on Christian principles. You know, and, and there's a lot of folks out there that try to deny the Christian uh, basis on which our nation was established. They tried to say that the Thomas Jeffersons and George Washingtons and Benjamin Franklins and all those folks were deists. Now, I don't want to go into great detail with this, but basically a deist believes there's a God. He created, whew, hurled it out there, let it go. You know, they're, they're too smart to realize that all this would just happen with boom, one big bang. They know that somebody had to create it. But they don't want the relationship. They don't want to have to be accountable. Every child knows they have a parent. Sometimes a child wants to sever that, does not want that relationship, does not want to be accountable, does not want to attribute to the fact that my parents got, gave me a good start. You know, the, 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 the child denies well, that's kind of like a deist. Well, you see, we have a created order. We see a logic. We see that, 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 that God created, that God loved. He loved so much, he sent Jesus. He gave us a plan, and he didn't give us a plan without a hope. He, Jesus rose again to give us that hope that we can look forward to what he's going to do in our lives. We, we don't know what that, what's down the road. But we know that where he takes us, if we stay with him on that journey, what he's going to accomplish. Let's go on to verse 23. But each in his own order. There's that word logic that we talked about. There's that logic that God is, that, that, that Paul is referring to. There's a logic. Christ, the first fruits afterward at his coming, those who belong to Christ, those who belong to him, he's going to receive. He's going to take care of them. 
if we've given ourselves to him, just as he has experienced a resurrection, we too will have experienced a resurrection. Then comes the end. Okay, so what he's, what he's giving us here is, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, you know, there'll be a shout, and first he will come, in, and those who have gone before us will, will join him in the air, and then we will be drawn up, you know, in 1 Thessalonians 4. He's, 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 he's giving a picture, of, a more clear picture in 1 Thessalonians 4 of what he's saying here. He said, but the first fruits, first Jesus, then us, who belong to Christ, and then will be the end. The end times. Now, whether we're talking the millennium, in Revelation, um, I'm not going to go into that. We don't have time to go into that. But the bottom line is, look at the sequence. The sequence is, first Jesus, then us, and then the end. So he gives him a very quick nutshell. Then comes the end, when Jesus is going to hand over the kingdom to God, the Father. He's going give it, to give it to the Father. When he abolishes all of the rule, all of the oppression, uh, that word, that Greek word there kind of represents being over, all of the oppression, and then all of the authority, which kind of represents all of those leaders out there that are vying for power, and then finally, and power, all the rule, authority, and power, and there's that word dunamis, which means dynamite. We got our word dynamite, power, the threats, the potential that, that, that threaten us. So he says, then he's going to hand, hand everything over to the Father, and he's going to get rid of all of the problems that we have in this life. Verse 25, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. That's the beginning of the end. That's the beginning of the end when Jesus comes back, receives us, and takes over. He gets, again, like in John, he gets just a glimpse and writes a revelation. Paul's evidently had a glimpse, and he tries to explain it to us. He tries to give us a quick picture of it, of what's going to happen, and then he moves on. Verse 26, the last enemy to be abolished is death. No more death. Remember what John said? No more sea. No more separation. No more death. That'll be the last thing we have to worry about. Getting rid of the, the fact that we have to fear separation from our loved ones, fear separation from God, fear separation, you know, when that's when that's over, when that, that that's our last enemy to worry about. For God has put everything under his feet. Now when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. Jesus is, is the exception. Gets a little bit con, a little bit confusing here, but just, again, this is one of those things you just accept. We have God the Father, and you have Jesus the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that the Son can only do what the Father is showing him, what the Father is doing. Jesus said that himself in his Gospels. The Father can only do what the Father, the Son can only do what the Father shows him. And the Spirit is at work in us bringing us to where the Father wants us. So you see there is God the Father but they are three equal all working together to accomplish the one. A little bit confusing. There's three in one. Three all working together to bring one purpose. And so the Son in this kingdom down here, he's going to bring all of this under the authority of the Father. And then we'll all, be, we'll all be one. Verse 28, when everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. Here's the picture. It's all brought together as one. Right now, we have God the Father in heaven who is at work creating and caring for and taking care of all of his creation and everything. We have the Son who's come to earth and shed his blood and provided for us our plan, our salvation. We have the Spirit that's at work in our life right now helping us deal with all the issues we have to deal with, helping me teach this lesson. So, but one day, you won't need the Son. No more blood. 
You don't need the spirit, no more spirit, because we are all one with the Father. We'll all be one together in heaven, in the New Jerusalem. And so all things will be subjected so that God may be all in all, all one, all unity. Everything has been brought together. There is no more division, no more separation. Okay, let's go back to that verse I said earlier, verse 35. Someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? Paul's going to go on all the way up to where we're going to pick up here in verse uh, 54. He's going to give a long, try to tell us. The bottom line is this. What kind of body are we going to have? The best picture we can get is the body of Jesus. Now, Jesus was able to, um, here, put your hands in my nail print. Put your fist in my side. You know, Jesus had a physical body. Jesus was on the seashore and having breakfast with the guys. Jesus walked and talked and touched and hugged and did all those things. We know when he was on earth after the resurrection, we know also that his body was not restrained. He walked through walls and locked doors. And so what kind of body are we going to have? I don't know. But we can look at Jesus and get an idea. And then Paul goes on to say, all the way through there, the immortal must put on the, the mortal must put on the immortal, the flesh must put on the spirit. Read those verses on your own. And let Paul kind of try to describe to you what he's seeing, what, what God has given him. But let's get down to the, back to the learner guide in verse 54. And it says, when this corruptible. Okay, so Jesus was resurrected. Jesus was resurrected so that it's not just for this life only, but for our future. And we too will be resurrected. And this is this is the sequence. He gives us a sequence we just read. You know, first Jesus, then us, then then the end will come. Uh, so we got the sequence, and now he that now the the conclusion is the conclusion. When it happens, this is not an if it happens. It's a when it happens. When this corruptible body, when this sinful body, is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, death, is your victory? Where, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. When it happens, it will happen. We don't have to wonder or question or doubt. We can know that it's going to happen. This corruptible will become incorruptible. This sinful will become perfect, cleansed. This mortal, this temporary, will become immortal and be forever. And then the saying, the saying from uh, Hosea 13, 12 through 14. You can look at that, look at that up on your own. It's in your learner guide. Um, Hosea 13, 12 through 14. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The, gra uh, the, 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 um, the grave of this world is, is not the end. You know, sometimes uh, when I stand, I, I said we use this passage at, at the cemetery many times for the committal part. And I will oftentimes say that to the world, this is the end. But to us, it is the beginning. That grave is not the end for the believer, the child of God. That grave is the beginning of life everlasting. That life that we've never, that we cannot begin to imagine or experience or understand right now. So death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? There is no victory in death. Death, where is your sting? And then I love this verse. Verse 56. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. All right, let me give you a, a little, draw you another picture. We see a mosquito. Okay? That mosquito goes, we see a mosquito go, uh-oh. Because we know what that mosquito does. It stings. And when it stings, we get a well for an itch. And we don't like it. We have to scratch. So, look what it is. The law could be the mosquito. We see that law, I go, uh-oh. 
I have sinned. I'm about to get stung. And then we feel the effects. The law shows us our sin. The sin brings death. Only Jesus' blood is the remedy for the sting, the sin. So when you see a mosquito, <laughs> no. When we look at God's law, when we think about God's word for us and how that word is to speak us, that word is to be that mirror that shows us our imperfections, our sin. And if we don't want to die, if we don't want that sin to sting us, then we've got to make sure we stay in line with where God wants us to be, in line with Jesus. The sting of death is sin. The power of the sin is, is the law. But thanks be to God. He wraps it up in a very positive way. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Always, always, always give him praise. I, I wrote a, a hymn of the, the week, was it, I guess it's a couple weeks ago. Now thank we all our God. Not very familiar. We rarely, if ever, sing it in our church. But it, it is a classical hymn that the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and other churches will sing often. And uh, it was written during a time of the 30-year war when millions upon millions of people were killed over a, a period of 30 years. And it talked about how the, man, the, the minister would do as many as 50 funerals a day. And he wrote the hymn. Because no matter how dark or gloomy you may think your situation and circumstances might be, God is with you. He's not going to leave you alone. If you're in his will and you're looking to him, he's going to take you beyond where you think you could ever be. So always give him praise. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, just like verse 1, he began 15 1 with my brothers and sisters. He's going to close it out with my brothers and sisters. Be steadfast, stand firm, immovable. Don't be swayed by those Greeks and those false philosophies. Don't, don't let yourself be, you know, it is so tough in our world today. It's so hard to stay in the word and in the faith. It's so easy to want to do what our friends do, what our bosses tell us to do, what our television says tell us to do. It's so easy to be swayed. He says, be steadfast and firm. Be immovable. Don't be swayed. Always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor for the Lord is not in vain. We have a purpose. We have a result. What are you doing for the Lord? Where is it? that God wants to take you? What is it that God wants to accomplish in your life? What is it that he can do with you that only he can do if you let him? God wants to bring about something that's worthwhile, meaningful, with a great deal of potential. We just have to let him and follow him and be faithful to him. Let's look at our questions at the end and wrap it up. Why the resurrection matters to us? Where is God taking you on your road to eternity? You know, we think about next week, next year. How about the road to eternity? What does he want you to become? What is he wanting you to become? A loving, giving, generous? You know, one, uh, one of the things... When I was, when we were, McKay and I were young and raising babies, um, money was, seemed like always there was too much month and not enough money. And it was hard. And I used to pray then that I could, I could have a generous spirit. I wanted to be like a lot of our older folks in, at First Baptist here, you know, 30 years ago, and how they could just write a check and be, be generous and be giving and, and move out of the way, just move their life over and just do whatever they need to do. And, and I think, you know, God's definitely brought me on the road. I've gotten closer to it. I'm not there yet. I can be more generous. He can teach me some more. And I'm trying to let him. But what does he want you to become? More loving, more caring, more patient, more gentle, more soft-spoken? What kind of a person is he wanting you to become? And are you on the way? Let me draw one last picture. 
you know, I've made a lot of trips back and forth from St. Louis to Kansas City and St. Louis and Marshall. You can call out a mile marker, and I can tell you where the next exit is for gas or to go to the bathroom. You can, I can tell you where the next McDonald's are. I, I know where the cheapest gas stations are. I, I know I-70 between here and St. Louis. But you know what? If you miss I-70 and stay on 65, you'll never get to St. Louis. If you get off at 63 or 54, you'll never make it to St. Louis. If you get off at Highway 5 or Highway 7, Highway 5, you'll never make it to St. Louis. You got to make sure you stay on I-70. And as you watch those mile markers, as you look back and you see the progress you've made, and as you look forward to where you want to be, then you can think about arriving. What does God, what do, I know what's waiting for me in St. Louis. We don't know what's waiting for us in eternity. But we know who's going to take us. And so just trust him. He knows the way. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the day that you've given us and thank you for this lesson. I can become so passionate about your word and about what you have to say and how you want to say it. I can get so excited. I can ramble. Lord, I pray that uh, as uh, we think about what you're going to do with our lives, just causes us to stand in awe and amazement. And I pray that we can grow in our faith and our confidence and our trust as we walk with you. And I pray that we can always keep our eyes on Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He went before us in going to that cross and going to that grave and rising again. Help us to look forward to our resurrection. Bless this day. Bless our families and our homes. Bless our church. And bless our nation in this time of virus. And we pray that you'll bless our leaders to bring us to a point where we can meet again and be together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.